You have no excuse to be ordinary by Pastor Sunday at a lie. Excuse, excuse. So many times we think we have excuses. We think we have excuses for the place where we are in life. We think we have excuses for what we are doing. We think we have excuses for not attaining all we could have in life. Sometimes we think we have excuses when things don't quite work out the way we have planned. To so many people, excuses have become an escape route by which they get by in life. We give excuses for everything. To some it is now a second nature to excuse themselves of any failure or inadequacies. Sometimes we indeed believe in what we profess. We do believe that we have excuses. When compared with other circumstances, when we compare our situation with people in worse circumstances, the story might be different. Things don't always look the way we perceive them to be. As a student of the Bible, I am often fascinated by some of its stories. In this particular case, I am thinking of a situation with one of Jesus' disciples. Philip was one of the twelve disciples of Jesus. Oh wow! What a privileged place to be! To many of us, Philip's position is the ultimate. The best imaginable aspiration anyone could ever get to. Come to think of it, will you believe that in such a position, someone in the place of Philip will still have an excuse? I know what you are thinking, you are probably saying to yourself, no, if I were to be in Jesus' team, one of his twelve disciples, of course I won't be having any excuses. The only thing I needed to know, is to be sure that the maker of the universe himself is beside me. Everything I need or could ever need are automatically provided for. After all, I am right here in his team already. Unfortunately, it doesn't always work out this way. Even some of the most privileged of us still often find excuses. At a time when Philip thought he lacked something even right in the presence of Jesus, you wonder what the rest of the world should be thinking. If the rest of the world were to be giving excuses, nobody will be doing anything, they will only be left with excuses. Imagine someone as close as Philip was to Jesus yet complaining. That stands a good argument for the rest of us to simply sit around and complain. That is exactly what happens to most of us when we complain. In actual sense, there are always people who are in a worse situation than us at any given moment in time. No matter how horrible you feel your situation is, not minding what excuses you think you have, there are people in worse conditions and yet not complaining. Don't I have an excuse? Let's take a close look at the scripture that tells us the story of Philip. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you I do not speak on my own authority. But the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. John 14 verses 8 to 11 in Philip's estimations. If Jesus could only show them the Father, he would have what it takes to do whatever he desires to do in life. Only one thing is missing, show us the Father. In other words he was trying to say, Yes Jesus we enjoy your company, it's great that you are around, it's wonderful being with you, but you see we are limited, we can't do much. You see, you are doing everything you are doing because you know the Father, you've got the Father. We are helpless, we can't do much. And we can't even begin to imagine doing what you're doing because we have an excuse. We don't know the Father. If only we could know the Father, our story will be different. If only we had known the Father, we could have been doing everything you expected from us. So Jesus, thank you for all you have been to us. Just one little thing remaining, show us the Father. As a matter of fact, if you show us the Father, that will be enough for us. Just show us the Father. In spite of Philip's passionate plea, Jesus being a master of men and thoughts that he was, he knew that there is no end to people's desires. I am almost sure Jesus knew that there is no guarantee that Philip and his friends could be satisfied as they claimed. If you don't know how to be satisfied with the little you have, there is no guarantee that when you are given much, 
you were going to be satisfied. Even though Philip claimed that if Jesus will only show them the Father they shall be satisfied, or in his words Lord, show us the Father and it is sufficient for us. Well, not really. Our desires and wants are always unlimited and infinite in its scope. The proof that showing them to the Father will still not satisfy them, is in the fact that they actually already had him and they were not satisfied. The Father had indeed been with them all along, it's just that they didn't know. So if they are not satisfied now, they will never get to the stage where they will actually be satisfied. This is a tendency with people. If you are the type that has not learned to be satisfied at any stage in your life, more and greater will still not guarantee you satisfaction. People who have the tendency to be unsatisfied, don't normally get satisfied easily. Let me now take you to the story of another man, which will prove to us that in life what matters is not the amount of provision or resources that we have, but our ability to maximize what we have. So, even though we tend to think that we are not fulfilled because of one thing or the other that we lack, in the real sense though, our lack of satisfaction and fulfillment is not connected to what we ever lack. In life, it is not what you have or lack that determines who you become. People have experienced success with less than what you have, even though you're thinking you don't have much. While on the other hand, others have experienced failure in spite of what they have. Meaning, you could have more than enough for success and still fail thinking it is because you don't have enough. It is therefore not what you have or lack in life that determines your destiny, but it is what you do with what you have that matters. Let's assume that you don't have a million dollars, and you use that as the excuse why you have not come to fulfillment. On the other hand, you have at least a few thousand US dollars. In your own mind, with a few thousand US dollars, you cannot do much. Meanwhile on the other side of the world or city, another person of your age is growing up, and also does not have a million dollars, and yet does not think of it. As a matter of fact, in his own case he does not even have a few thousand US dollars. Maybe he doesn't even have a few hundred US dollars. But thanks to the fact that he was able to maximize what he has, he is able to come to fulfillment and satisfaction in life. This goes a long way to confirm the fact that what matters in life is not what we have or don't have, but what we do with whatever we have. For this purpose also I labor, striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. Colossians 1 verse 29 maximizing the little Paul and like Philip, did not even have the opportunity to be with Jesus as one of his disciples. As a matter of fact, he did not even have the opportunity to personally minister with Jesus. He did not learn from Jesus directly. He did not have the chance to see how Jesus ministered. He did not see Jesus fellowship with the Father, unlike Philip. He was not trained under Jesus, unlike Philip. He never spent a day with Jesus, while Philip spent three years with Jesus. Yet, one thing with Paul, he never had an excuse. Despite all the privileges and opportunities Paul never had, he had learned to maximize the little he had. He was not demanding to be introduced to the Father. He was not even asking for Jesus to directly train him first before he could be useful for him. He didn't ask to be first a disciple before he could represent Christ. The only thing Paul had was his consciousness. What Paul had going for him was his right mindset. He hid his focus right. While Philip was focusing on what he didn't have rather than on what he had, Paul didn't make that mistake. He was rather focusing on the little he had and how to maximize it, rather than on those things he didn't have. According to that scripture in Colossians 1 verse 29, the only ground that Paul had upon which he based his exploits was the awareness and the faith that God's power was working in him. He couldn't fall back to his time with Jesus. He couldn't rely on the memory of how Jesus did things. No. He could not fall back on his experience with Jesus. He couldn't even fall back on the fact that he had a personal relationship and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He could not fall back on his years of living with Christ. No, he didn't have as much to fall back on. While Philip needed to see God the Father so that he could work mighty things, Paul on the other hand was working those mighty things, just on the fact that he is conscious that God is in him. He didn't need to see God physically. He only needed to be aware of the God in him. 
What I am trying to tell you my dear readers is the fact that if you could have as little as that same awareness that God isn't you, you are ready to do anything you wish to do in life. You don't really need much. What you need is that same awareness of God's power working in you as Paul had. A simple awareness of what you carry is enough for you to do exploits for God and man. You don't really need much, you only need to get your awareness right, and then the world is at your feet. If you can get your consciousness focused correctly on what you know, that God is in you, then you are ready to go and become anything you wish to become. Your focus is what matters, are you focusing on what you already have? Or you are focusing on what you lack? Philip had so much, at least he had Jesus standing right there with him. Yet he was focused on God the Father he thought he didn't have. Anytime we are busy thinking of things we don't have, we become blind to the obvious things within our reach. Focusing and thinking of what you lack only makes you poorer. Whenever your focus is on what you presently lack, you will not be able to maximize the little you have. As in the case with Paul, he didn't have the company of Jesus, he didn't have the presence of the other disciples, and he didn't have the three years of training. He physically didn't have anything tangible to fall back on. Nothing to show physically is his evidence. The only little thing he had was not physical, totally intangible. A simple awareness that God is in him, that is all. He couldn't show that to anyone, but Paul held on to that knowledge. That knowledge became his stronghold. It became his vantage point and through that he worked wonders for God. Whatever you focus on increases. Our mind magnifies whatever you focus on. True focus will begin to see in more details, the object of our focus. When Philip, for example, kept his focus on the fact that there is something he was missing, such feeling of inadequacy grows. He will begin to feel in a greater sense that he lacked something than he felt in the presence of Jesus with him. Lack and inadequacies become greater reality to him than the very physical presence of Jesus with him. On the other hand, Paul too was focusing on something but in his case, he was focusing on the positive. He was focusing on his awareness that God's power was working in him. That focus magnifies the reality of God in his life to the extent that in Paul's mind, he is no longer the one doing the mighty works, but it is now the God in him, he sees doing the work through him. Ladies and gentlemen, instead of giving excuses for what you lack, why don't you just begin to magnify and increase the little you have through the power of focus? If the only thing, just like Paul, you have is the simple awareness of God and you, good for you. That is a good enough starting point. Focus on that power of God in you until you begin to see that it is no longer you doing the work. It is no longer your power it will take to do the work, but the power of the mighty God that is in you will do the work for you. When you begin to see through your inner eyes God in you, then he begins to be the one working through you, instead of you doing the work by yourself. If on the other hand you only see yourself and your limitations, then you have to do all the struggling, the laboring and the suffering, with your very limited resources. Paul had a better choice, he could see the power of God working mightily though him. He is simply the carrier of that power. God is the one doing the job while Philip is busy looking for God to physically appear to him before he could move and begin to do exploits, Paul on the other hand is teaching us the secret of all exploits in life, our awareness, the mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. To them God will to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Colossians 1 verses 26 to 27 This secret that Paul is now sharing with us used to be a mystery that a simple awareness that Christ in us gives hope for glory, is all you and I need to accomplish anything on earth. The awareness that Christ and the power of God is in you will release God to work through you. That awareness will cause God's power to work in you. That awareness will cause God's glory to come on the earth through you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Let's now compare this revelation of Paul with what Philip had. Philip had Jesus physically with him and yet could not believe that he had all that he needed for life and exploits. Paul on the other hand never saw Jesus, he never had him with him physically. He rather developed his awareness based on what he knows that God is in all of us. 
He focused so strongly on that awareness that he basically could see God working and doing wonders through him. Friends, your focus creates your pictures of life. Paul's focus created his paradigm. His focus created his reality of life. His focus created his worldview. His focus created the pictures which he eventually lived out in real life. If you want, you could call it faith. By faith Christ dwells in us. By faith we know his power is in us and through faith we see him work in us. That faith breaks the limitation of our humanity. It cracks open the limitedness of our human power. So much that we are now aware and sure that whenever we step out, we know we work for him but not in our mind. We work for him in the might of his power that is in us. In Jesus' answer to Philip, he kind of rebuked him saying if you have seen me, you should know that you have seen the Father. Jesus is trying to tell Philip and the other disciples, even me, I am not seeing God the Father physically while here on earth, but you see me physically. You have a great advantage than I have in relations to the Father. Even Jesus while on earth had to see the Father through the power of his faith and focus like Paul did, not physically like the disciples saw him. On the other hand, Jesus operated with the Father here on earth through the power of awareness. He was aware that the Father was with him. He didn't need to see him physically. He focused on that awareness that the Father said he will never leave him nor forsake him. Through the right focus he could magnify the awareness that God was with him. Through that power of focus he could see the Father working in and through him on the earth. Jesus never demanded for God the Father to come to the earth physically to be with him so that he could function. He was simply using the same principle he was trying to teach his disciples. Amazingly Paul who was never with him, got it. Like Paul, Jesus would often say things like, It is not me doing the work, it is my Father in me doing the work. He will often say, If you see me you have seen the Father. He will often say, I have come to reveal the Father. He will often say, I am the Father I want. Where did he get this assurances from? He got it from focusing on what he knew. He got it by focusing on the power of his awareness. If you like you can say he got it through the power of faith. The secret of the power working through a Jesus is that, by faith, he realized that God the Father was inside him doing the work through him. So through his eyes of faith, Jesus could see what Philip couldn't see. He could see God in him, working through him. The secret of producing the same result as Jesus, Paul and other disciples produced, is in the same principle the awareness and the focus on the God inside that is working through us. If you too will believe that God is in you, working mightily in you as he did with Jesus and Paul, you will begin to see the same results as they saw. Your focus must be on the God in you and his power working through you. Your focus must never shift to what you don't have. Your focus should never be given to those things you lack. Let your focus always be on what you are aware of, the God that is working mightily through you. Jesus once told his disciples that those who believe in him will do the same work as he did or even greater works. For us to do what Jesus did and greater works, we must believe as Jesus believed in the one that is inside of us, working mightily with his power through us. Jesus had to believe that the Father was in him doing the work. So also must we believe that Jesus and God the Father are in us, working mightily in us to do God's will on the earth. Learn to utilize your awareness of God. Don't just keep the knowledge in your head that God lives in you. It is your active awareness of that knowledge that releases his power to work through you. That is why the Bible tells us that without faith it is impossible to please God. It is that faith and the awareness of God working through us that activates and empowers the knowledge we have in our mind. Ladies and gentlemen, will I be right to now say that you and I have no excuse to be ordinary? If God's power is in us and we are aware of it, and we could focus on that awareness, if we could picture God working mightily through us, it will be a shame and a disgrace for us to be ordinary. You and I don't have an excuse to be ordinary. That is the secret behind the ministry of Paul the Apostle. He clearly could picture Jesus the hope of glory, working in and through him mightily. This he accomplished through the power of focus, and the power of faith. When you and I begin to believe, when we begin to focus right, when our focus is on the awareness of his mighty power working through us, then we shall begin to witness the same wonders Paul witnessed in his ministry.
Remember, even the Lord Jesus used this same secret to do the extraordinary in his life and ministry. He focused on the awareness that God the Father was in him and with him. Then he stepped out by faith to act in that assurance and awareness. If we will emulate our fathers of faith, if we will follow in the footsteps of the author and finisher of our faith, that same faith will work for us to do and undo in his name and for his glory. For the love of God, Church and Nation by Pastor Sunday at Elia.